This is the 13th annual Muslim Day at the Capitol. Michigan, I need you to support, to knock doors, to vote for Abdul El Sayed. We're back. To give you an idea of how many Muslim candidates running for office throughout the United States, we've put together a partial list to give you a sense of how pervasive it is. Uh, there's over 100 candidates coast to coast, but I'm going to read you 20 names that we selected at random. I apologize in advance. I'll probably get most of their Arabic names wrong. In Michigan, Abdul El Sayed for governor. Rochester, Minnesota, Regina Mustafa for mayor. Deidre Aboud in Arizona for U.S. Senate. Ilan Omar in Minnesota for U.S. Congress. Jamal Abdullah in Minnesota for United States Congress. Rashida Talab in Michigan, U.S. Congress. Farooz Saad in Michigan for U.S. Congress. Omar Kudrait in California for U.S. Congress. Fayaz Nawabi in San Diego for City Council. Jesse Sabahi in Nevada for U.S. Senate. Kim Hamadanchi in California for U.S. Congress. Nadia Hashimi in Maryland, U.S. Congress. Samina Mustafa in Illinois, U.S. Congress. Keith Ellison, still second ranking member of the Democratic Party, former congressman, now running for Attorney General of Minnesota. Hadia Avzal, of, of, of Illinois, Board of Education. Omar Vaid, New York, U.S. Congress. Bushira Amilwala, Illinois, Cook County Board of Education. Asif Mahmood in California for Insurance Commissioner. Kavan Kalabatabari, Colorado, Mayor of Denver. Amir Malik, Minnesota State Representative. That's 20 names. I probably got most of them wrong, but it gives you a sense of the more than 100 that are running for office across the country. Now, earlier in the show, we discussed the compatibility of Sharia and democracy with Annie Cyrus. Now we're going to introduce you in detail to some of the new Muslim faces on the political scene. But first, here is anti-Israel Israel, Muslim activist Linda Sarsour explaining the progressive thread that binds them all together. She's the co-founder of the Women's March. She's a Time Magazine cover girl. She's won awards for nearly every progressive group across America. Here's Linda. If you are not progressive on the issue of Palestine, then you are no damn progressive. Yeah. Black people haven't been liberated fully in the United States of America for 450 years. You better believe we ain't getting liberation in Palestine until black people are free in this country. That's my personal yeah. Yeah. Can somebody remind me of a staunch pro-Israel organization that has come out in support or stood up against the killing of unarmed black people by law enforcement in this country. If you know one, I want to know who they are because I don't see that happening, right? So what I want you to understand is what I said yesterday is that the same people who justify the massacres of Palestinian children and innocent civilians in Palestine and call it collateral damage are the same people that will find excuses to justify murders of unarmed people in this country by law enforcement. Don't sleep. Don't sleep on the connection. So the question is who's defining who's liberal and progressive? You can't be liberal if you're not for the justice and freedom of Palestinian people. That's right, just my right. personal yeah. view about that. And I'll say this about the DNC. I'm a DNC. I'm, I'm a delegate to the DNC. Yay. So she's teaching that those that justify massacres of Palestinians also justify murder of blacks and the people she's referring to that do that are American and Israeli Jews. It's a scandal to hear her words. And she has given rise to a young lady in Brooklyn, New York, named Acasio, running for Congress. Ms. Acasio explains that 60 unarmed people killed in New York, also killed in Ferguson and Gaza, not true, all the same, but she's totally clueless. As an activist, as an organizer, if 60 people were killed in Ferguson, Missouri, if 60 people were killed in the South Bronx, unarmed, 60 people were killed in, in Puerto Rico, I just looked at that incident more through uh, through just 
as an incident. And to me, it would just be completely unacceptable if that happened on our shores. But uh, I am, of course, the, the dynamic there in terms of geopolitics of and the course. war in the Middle East is very different than mm. people expressing their First Amendment right to protest. Well, yes. But I also think that what people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine, is um, just an, an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition. And that, to me, is just where I tend to mm -hmm. come from on this issue. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um, I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements that are increasing in, in some of these areas and, and places where, um, where Palestinians are experiencing uh, difficulty in access to uh, their housing and homes. Do you think you can expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd also just, I, I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue, you know. She talks about the Palestinians being occupied, when in reality only 5% of the West Bank and 0% of Gaza is occupied by anybody. And when they drill down and ask her questions, she's literally speechless. They're just progressive talking points. Here's Ilan Omar talking to us about national security and immigration. I think over the past few years, more than 20 young Somali Americans have left uh, to go and fight for ISIL or Al-Shabaab or one of these quote unquote jihadist groups abroad. A lot of conservatives in particular would say that the rise in Islamophobia is a result not of hate, but of fear, a legitimate fear, they say, of quote unquote jihadist terrorism, whether it's Fort Hood or San Bernardino or the recent truck attack in New York. Uh, what do you say to them? I would say uh, uh, our, our country should be more fearful um, of, of, of white men across our country because they are actually um, causing uh, most of the deaths within this country. Um, and so if fear was the, the driving force of, of, of policies to keep America safe, Americans safe inside of this country, um, we should be uh, profiling, monitoring, um, and, uh, and, and creating policies to fight the radicalization of white men. Rashida Talab on her views. She's against the terrible massacre of Palestinians, which, by the way, is not taking place. No, oh, you all know Rashida. Put it together for Rashida. Thank you, thank you. I'm standing here not only as an American, because we are Americans too. That's right. And we are against the illegal, the illegal occupation of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. But let me tell you, I'm also here as a mother. Our children should never, never be part of this kind of massacre. And here's the most powerful person in the country never elected, Huma Abedin. She was Hillary's closest advisor for decades, worked at the radical Muslim Brotherhood newspapers. She worked for that family paper for 12 years, still run by her family. She had access to Hillary's connections from all over the world, including top secret documents. She worked for the first lady in the White House, then the senator, then the secretary of state, and then presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton. More on the Clinton Foundation. The New York Post broke a bombshell story that one of Hillary Clinton's top aides, Shim Abedin, worked at a radical Muslim journal for a dozen years. Some of those years covered the same time while she was working at the White House as an intern for then First Lady Hillary Clinton. It's the Abedin family has got ties that, that go to the Muslim Brotherhood and a whole bunch of radical organizations. This is Hillary Clinton in Saudi Arabia where she was on a state visit and introduced there by Huma Abedin's mom. I think we're gonna show it. So there it is, our viewers can see. And they are still together to this day. So I ask you, America, why are these hateful words of these people not be taken into consideration when we make our opinions? How did progressive become anti-Semitic and anti-American? So the question is, who's defining who's liberal and progressive? You can't be liberal if you're not for the justice and freedom of Palestinian people. That's right, just my right. personal yeah. about that. Why is the rejection of the values of the American Constitution somehow acceptable today 
in the same sense of understanding that it's okay to praise politicians who may have a different boss than the boss you think they're electing to listen to, which is the U.S. and state constitutions, which are in alignment all over the country. You hear the people asking that you make this into a sanctuary city. Yeah. We say refugees are welcome here. These are questions that American voters must be asking now and sadly are not being asked by anywhere on the mainstream media. I strongly urge you to look at these candidates' views, comments, and especially their political backgrounds in depth. Andre Carson was one. I, I, I have met with him as have other members of the Black Caucus. Keith Ellison. Now Keith was in the nation in 1995. That's right. He was selling the Final Call newspaper. Right. Beautiful brother. Here's the problem. The problem is that, you know, the United States needs to continue to say illegal settlement construction in, is, is wrong and expansion is, is, is wrong and it's illegal and it has to stop. And it has to stay firm on that point. Um, the Israelis, on the other hand, are saying, well, we're just, we're just, uh, we're not expanding the boundaries, we're just building up. But they're building up on land they've already taken. We are against the illegal, the illegal occupation of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. What people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine. Do your own research and find out if what I'm telling you is the truth. And if it does, I hope it scares the heck out of you and it gets you to vote. We will be right back.